Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you and open God's Word together, and uh, it's a joy to just behold our, our Savior um, together as His bride. And with that being said, open up to Psalm 16, and I hope that through this chapter you would do that very thing, that you would behold Jesus Christ. Psalm 16, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the righteous ones, the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's a fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let us pray together. Oh, Father, what a wonderful passage before us today. Such glories are contained in it. It speaks of something wonderful. What no eye has seen or ear has heard. And so, Lord, I pray that you would tune this instrument of weakness to proclaim your glory to these people today, that their hearts might together behold Jesus Christ and enter into his joys. Lord, only you can do this. Only you can cause your word to bear fruit in the hearts of all your people. And so I look to you and you alone as the revealer of hearts to do this very thing today. In your name, amen. What do you look forward to? What is that thing that you long after that gets you up every day, that makes you strive forward? What's that goal? What's that purpose? What's that aim? Maybe you're, uh, you're not aiming for the right thing. Maybe you are aiming for the right thing. And maybe you don't even know what to aim for at all. Perhaps you've even lost sight of the goal. And there's nothing to look forward to. Because the fact of the matter is, is that the Christian life is difficult, and to say otherwise is a lie. Each Christian has been called to take up their cross and follow Christ. And it's this cross which weighs so many down, which causes the seed that is sown among the rocks to fall away. For having no root in himself, he walks away because of persecution or tribulation on account of the word. <laughs> These difficulties are guaranteed, which is why the Bible tells us to not be surprised when we're faced with trials of various kinds. And so I'm not surprised if you've come in today with a crushing burden upon your shoulders. Some of you might feel so uncertain about your remaining days, whether or not you will endure the rest of the forthcoming trials. Afraid you might walk away from the faith in some future date. 
Some of you have no joy at the end of the tunnel and you feel discouraged to continue on any further. Others have perhaps set their joys on things that are uncertain, on maybes. Pressing on toward possibilities in hopes that those might be fulfilled. Others here have sins that you feel like you can't have victory over. Finding yourself often discouraged, uncertain if you'll ever be free. Others, you might have broken families, children that distance themselves from you because of your faith. Maybe you've come in today thinking that you have nothing going on for you. That everything you do is a failure. You feel no sense of purpose, and you're surrounded by those who succeed and prosper, and you ask, when will it be my turn? You might feel that you have no direction in life, so dull of heart, wondering what it would even be like if you were to just die. You might come in today being emotionally burdened, feeling at any moment that you might just break down in tears, confused, aimless, exhausted, anxious, discouraged, perhaps even thinking that this service will be your last try with God. And if you're honest with yourself, your present afflictions are heavy, your fears make you lose sleep, anxieties grip your heart, and your life is affected. Your work is struggling, your family is broken, old sins that you once thought you had victory over are are resurfacing. Feeling oh so, so uncertain if you're even a true believer. You might feel like Israel when they were encountered by the Egyptians at the Red Sea. Thrown into despair after seeing all the signs and wonders that God did in Egypt to that point. Feeling like God has done all these mighty things for you until this day, but suddenly he's forgotten you. You might feel concerned by the enemy crying out to God, Lord, have you brought me this far just to destroy my faith? Have you taken me here just to let my enemy overtake me? Why have I followed you if I could have just died as an unbeliever and just been a little more happy? And so I have one prayer for you this morning, that you would see such a beauty in the sufferings of Christ and such a glory in the joys that he looked forward to, that you who are hopeless would would find your hope and you who are joyless would find your joy and that you would fix your eyes on something that is true and wonderful. I hope that you will see that God does not intend to put any one Christian to shame but to bring us into the greatest joys that there possibly are. That regardless of what burden you come with today, that for Christians, there's something to look forward to. And so let us behold Christ together. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2 says uh, that we are to take up our cross and follow Christ and we are to be looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. Have you ever wondered, what was the joy that was set before the Lord by which he endured the cross? What was so great that Jesus endured this cross? Because his cross was heavier than all other crosses. And so how could somebody like him possibly have a joy set before him? What is left to look forward to when you're nailed to a tree? It kind of seems like you're done. There's nothing left. How can it be that that cross, which made him sweat blood, agonized, be mocked, humiliated, put to shame, made sin on our behalf, how did he endure this with a joy set before him? There was no greater agony than his. And there was no suffering like his suffering. No darkness like this darkness. The angels strengthened him after being tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. And they strengthened him again in the garden of Gethsemane. But who could strengthen him now? Who could comfort him now? Because there's never been recorded on earth or in hell suffering like this suffering. 
Because Jesus, he bore the wrath of God. He was crushed by his Father. He who has made sin was put face to face with the God who hates sin. What could possibly comfort him? This was such a trial that was turned to the hottest degree that all others who would even approach it would just be consumed like Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. If Job suffered as Christ suffered, he would have cursed God and died. If you put the mighty archangel Michael on the cross, he would blaspheme the God he was made to worship. The cross was no light thing. It would crush everybody who dared take it upon themselves. So I ask you this, if everyone else would have fled at the sight of the cross, how? How did Christ endure it? What was set before him? And I promise you this, that he was not the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Nor did he endure the cross by willpower or by the power of positive thinking. Hebrews 12 says it very plainly. It was because there was a joy that was set before him. And so I ask you yet again, what is the joy that is set before Jesus at the cross by which he endured it? Flip over to Acts chapter 2 before we jump into the psalm. There are many possibilities, all of which are true, of, of what that joy could have been. It could have been that the joy set before him was that he would crush his enemy, that he would uh, see the crushed head of Satan at his feet, that enemy which long ago plunged the world into ruin, and he would arise no more, and he would be conquered. That would be a great joy indeed, rejoicing over your defeated enemy. Or maybe that joy that was set before him is that he would save his people from their sins, that those saints in the land, the excellent ones in whom is all his delight, that he would save them, that he would have that joy of, of the groom on his wedding day as he receives his bride. And I tell you, that too is a great joy indeed. But above all these joys to look forward to, there was a joy greater than all other joys. And that was that after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. He would return to the glory that he had with the Father before the world existed. As he says in John 17, 5, Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Being glorified in God's presence was the highest joy set before him. And it's this joy that the 16th Psalm expounds. But before we do that, let's look at Acts chapter 2. Because I want to show you that this Psalm in its entirety is, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Verses 22 through 31. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will Make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, 
He foresaw and spoke about, his, about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. It's undeniable that this psalm quoted in uh, Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 13 in Paul's sermon is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This psalm, though it is a psalm of David, according to Paul and Peter, it is first a psalm of the son of David. Because they both testify that David fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and he saw corruption. It's Paul's rendering from Acts 13, 36. So this psalm, it eventually would be true about David because David would be resurrected in the last day, but it must first be true about Jesus Christ. And it's important that we make this distinction because certainly the psalm is of David and it's true of David but in a future date, but it must first be true and prophetic toward the offspring which is to come in the person of Jesus Christ. And one thing must be noted that every spiritual blessing comes to us in Jesus Christ. And that's just as true as it is of David, as well as you and I as Christians. For this psalm and many others cannot be true about us or about the psalmist unless they first be true about Jesus Christ. So Jesus, he must be the fulfillment of this psalm. He must be the one spoken of concerning these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Otherwise, if he is not, then this has no application to us or even to David. But since Jesus Christ has come and he has fulfilled this psalm, then these blessings that are true of him are also true of his people. Because faith brings us into union with Jesus Christ. What's his becomes ours. His life becomes our life. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. And I tell you this morning that his joys have become our joys. And so that's why Paul is confident to say in Ephesians 1 that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you take Christ out of the psalm, then you take out all the application For the word of God is never more applicable to you and I than when it is fulfilled in Christ. So I come to you today to show you what first belonged to Jesus so that you may enter into it. If you're at Psalm 16, look at me. Look with me at verse 11. He says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We see in this psalm the greatest weight of joy that far outweighed the weight of sorrow of being forsaken by God. And I ask you this, that if by this joy Jesus endured the cross, then what if that same joy was set before you today? Wouldn't that be how you endure the cross that God has called you to carry? What was sufficient for Christ, will it be sufficient for you? For Jesus does this very thing for us. He sets his own joys before us. The same joys that were set before him by which he endured the cross are the same joys that are set before each Christian here this morning. And by giving us his joy, he gives us the greatest possible thing to look forward to regardless of your present circumstances. There's not a higher joy than this joy. There's not a more overwhelming portion than this portion. There's not a greater thing to look forward to than this thing today. And so I want to behold the full weight of joy so that you might find the same heart of endurance through whatever you have encountered this season, be it death or sickness or loneliness or depression or missions or ministry or temptation, whatever dark colors your cross is painted with, however rugged it may be, 
how heavy of a burden it could be upon your shoulders, however rough its surface, however perverse the mocking which surrounds you, come with me to behold the joys of Christ, who puts all other crosses to shame. And come with me to behold his joys, which are unspeakable and full of glory. And so I want us to ask one question about the psalm. What about God's presence is a cause for the fullness of joy? What did Jesus see in God that made him long for it and find a joy that far outweighed his sorrows? But before we answer this question, I want us to enter into his sorrows and to see the depth that he was brought into. And so the first point I want us to understand today is that Jesus understands the weight of sorrow, of being separated from God. And that separation from God was the greatest sorrow there ever was. The further one is removed from the source of all joy, the greater the suffering, hence the greater the sorrow. The further you move away from the sun, the colder you will be. And so there is no greater sorrow than to be fully away from the source of all joy, just as there's no greater darkness than to be away from the source of all light. Therefore, it was no small thing that Jesus would be made sin on our behalf. That comes from 2 Corinthians 5.21. And then be forsaken by God. It's no small thing. Because he was fully removed from that source of infinite and perfect joy. Thus making those three hours on the cross to be the greatest hell there ever was. There was truly no sorrow like his sorrow. He experienced the full weight of sorrow being made sin because he was just separated from God. Don't forget that. He was brought into multiplied sorrow, a multiplication factor that cannot even be counted. For on the cross, he was treated as though he was the greatest idolater that ever lived. He was made sin. Therefore, he experienced all the sorrows and all the effects that sin brings. Verse 4. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. You see, Jesus, for us to enter into his joys, into the joys that belong to his righteousness and his glorious person, he had to first enter into our sorrows that were due to us for our sin. He experienced the full effect of sin so that you and I might experience the full weight of joy in him. Hence, when Jesus was made sin, he experienced none of the comforts of God's presence. And therefore, his sorrows multiplied as he experienced all the darkness and all the coldness that accompany being as one who is guilty before God. And it was not for his sin. Because Jesus did not sin. He was perfect through and through. He was no idolater. For there was never a worshiper like Jesus who truly did love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, who truly did love his neighbor as himself. Jesus did not suffer for his own sins because he didn't have any sin. And therefore, it's evident that it was our sin and our idolatry which brought him into this multiplied sorrow. Your idolatry multiplied his sorrows when he suffered for your sins. He was not agonizing because he was guilty. He was agonizing on that cross because you and I were guilty. 
Our idolatry only multiplies our sorrows, but it also multiplied his sorrows as he suffered for our sin and our idolatry and our not giving glory to God. And so do you think, do you think that it is a small thing to even slightly cling to your idols? Your smallest idols, which you think to be no big deal at all, were causes of great sorrow in the heart of Jesus. Every little sin, which you cling so closely, it clung to him as he suffered for it. Nothing is going to proclaim the the sickening nature of sin more than this. That Jesus was brought to this point of suffering and died. So let he who has made sin tell you of its sorrowful realities. Listen to him who suffered for your idolatry and hear him speak. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. They just go on forever and ever, deeper and deeper, sorrow upon sorrow, mourning upon mourning, weeping upon weeping, emptiness upon emptiness. And yet even though he suffered for sin, his relationship to God, it was the same. For God was still his portion. And he knew that God's wrath was for a moment, but that his favor was for, for forever. And so let's venture now to ask that question. What did Jesus see in God that made him endure the cross with a joy set before him? So our second point, Jesus endured the cross by being satisfied with his Father as his portion. He knew that God was his. Verses 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Jesus had no desire for any other God, but he set his desire fully upon his Father. God was his portion, and everything else was nothing in comparison. This God who was his portion was faithful, who was loving, who was incomprehensibly glorious. His sufferings never changed this fact, and so he cried out, My God, my God. He cried out to his Father as as he was his portion, or as verse 2 puts it, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. His greatest treasure was his God. And though he would receive a kingdom, and though he would receive a throne that is above all other thrones, and a name that is above all other names, his greatest portion was his God. Jesus would have nothing apart from his Father. What is the Son apart from his Father? They're co-equal, co-dependent co-eternal. As he says in verse 2, I have no good apart from you. Jesus would be filled with God and nothing else could fill him. All true religion comes from this sort of heart that treasures God And so we see here Jesus who has perfect love and worship and devotion in his heart. Because God was his portion, he saw that the lines had fallen for him in pleasant places. That indeed he had a beautiful inheritance. His pure devotion to God would not result in disappointment, but the outcome would rather be a glorious result. For Jesus would be preserved. His flesh would dwell secure. He would be risen from the dead. He would have a name that is exalted and a name that is above all other names. He would be brought to a throne that is above all other thrones, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. And all those saints in whom is all his delight would get to share in his joys and enter into union with himself and taste of his life and his righteousness and his blessedness. 
And so this could not be a more true statement that the lines fell for him in pleasant places. God's plan to exalt his son will be the most pleasing work that has ever taken place on this world or in heaven. It is great beyond all measure, pleasing beyond all measure, glorious. God's plan to exalt his son will be the most pleasing work ever accomplished. And so Jesus fully trusted in God's plan, fully took refuge in God and in his promises, and thus knew his position and God's plan for him was secure. And so our third point is that Jesus endured the cross with joy by fully knowing his security. Verses 9 and 10. Therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure, Why? Why are you so glad? What is the cause of this joy? And he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. His gladness was due to the certainty of his resurrection. His joy was not just being in God's presence, but being bodily in God's presence. He did not regard his resurrection lightly, but anticipated it with joy. Or as Hebrews 5, 7 says, he, he cried out to him who was able to save him from death. He just longed after it, looked forward to it. It was his great joy. He would not be satisfied with his spirit being in heaven and his body just remaining here on earth. What good does Jesus have in remaining dead? Or as Psalm verse. Uh, 6 verse 5 says, For in death there's no remembrance of you, and Sheol, who will give you praise? Or in Psalm 30 verse 9, What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? A Jesus that remains in the tomb, that's not resurrected, does not proclaim a faithful God. But a resurrected Jesus, on the other hand, proclaims a God who is perfectly faithful, whose steadfast love and faithfulness endures forever. He was convinced that God would not disappoint him, but that he would uphold all the promises made to him, that God would certainly be faithful and loving to him, and that he would not be forgotten in the grave. Jesus knew that because of God's steadfast love and faithfulness, that he would be risen from the dead according to the working of the immeasurable greatness of God's power. Verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. All Hell came against Jesus on that day. But he was not shaken because God was at his right hand. He set his God before him. Nothing can move him or shake him of his confidence in God. Nothing could take his eyes off his father. Even when forsaken, still did he cry, my God, my God. Not to some vague God, not to just some invisible God, but my God, my portion, mine, my Father, my Lord, mine. Jesus, though he was crucified, yet he was fully secure because God was his portion. And so fourthly, Jesus endures the cross, seeing the path of life and the fullness of joy in God's presence and the unending pleasures at God's right hand. Verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. To Jesus, this path of life was made known 
by the true essence of life, which consists in knowing God. He saw that knowing God is, is the greatest delight and greatest pleasure there ever was. So what is knowing God and being in God's presence? How is that a cause for joy? And this might be a question you ask. It doesn't make much sense to you, perhaps. Because you think your greatest joy is, is financial security, or perhaps it is a, a long, healthy life, or, or a, a cure, or, uh, or living out the American dream, or having a secure and stable nation for you and your children. Perhaps you think your greatest joy is maybe the reversal of a past event or the experience of traveling around all the world or a successful business or safe and prosperous children, maybe even retirement. And you ask yourself, what is this guy speaking of? How is knowing God a great joy, even the greatest joy? How could being in God's presence be this sort of joy to somebody? And you ask that question, because the extent of your religion is that God is just some concept in the heavens and not a person that you draw near to. He's not a person that you know. He's not a person that you have a relationship with. He's just there, and you don't draw near to him. He's just a concept or a myth. But to Jesus, he was his God, his portion, a real person, his father. And so there's others here that know exactly why Jesus saw this as the greatest joy. For you know the joys of knowing God, and I don't even have to explain to you the rest of the sermon, and you can just get up and leave. Please don't. <laughs> but others here know him so little, and his glories are hardly contemplated, and his love is barely tasted, and his faithfulness is hardly known. His power is very little thought of. And you've never tasted the joys of being in God's presence. There's some here who have set their heart on some sort of idol, ignorant to the fact that it, it's just going to multiply your sorrows. You scroll through your phones, thinking you'll be full, while your heart is lacking the riches of the Word of God. And it's no wonder why this joy is a mystery to you. You fill your heart with cravings after some victory or level of success in this life. And by doing so, you quench the delights of knowing God and being in His presence. You're so focused on the, the joys found in this world that you've completely forgotten the joys that are in heaven that are reserved for those who draw near to God, who will be with Him forever. And so I invite everybody today to come to Christ and, and see how your idolatry makes you miss out on the greatest joys that there, uh, that there could possibly be. What was it about God's presence that made it so wonderful that made Jesus endure this cross that was so awful, that made him in, uh, endure the, all the mocking, all the shame, all the ridicule. What was it? What did he see in God? And the answer, it was God's glory. It's the glory of God that can be just contemplated forever without weariness. William Bates, the Puritan, says that, that God lived forever in perfect contemplation of himself. It's the most wonderful thing about God. It's the infinite sum total of, of who God is. That God is so glorious that the Spirit of God, according to 2 Corinthians, searches the depths of him without getting bored. God's not bored with himself. Most of you guys get bored pretty quickly. God never gets tired of beholding himself because he is perfectly delighted in knowing himself. This is not uh, an egocentric God. It is a God that upholds the greatest thing there is. His glory, his goodness. There could not possibly, possibly be anything greater than God. He has to contemplate himself. He has to delight in himself. Otherwise, he's looking at something far lesser, 
far too unworthy for his holy and glorious eyes to behold. This is why Jesus desired to return to that face-to-face communion which he had with the Father from eternity past. This is the joy that was set before him. It was his thirst for God, his hunger for God, because he knew that he would taste these pleasures and be satisfied. It is this very glory which the angels behold and they cry out, holy, holy, holy. They have no other way to describe it because there's nothing like his glory. Pure, radiant, beaming with majesty. There's not a word written in the tongues of men or in the tongues of angels that can rightly describe the glories of God. And any attempt to do so would fall infinitely short of how glorious God actually is. And so Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians 12 as just being unable to be told. And in Ephesians chapter 3, it's just unsearchable riches. That's the best you got, Paul? Yep. Only God can fully comprehend the greatness of his own glory. God is altogether different and altogether greater than all other glories. If it is the brightness of the sun, he far outshines it. If it is the glory of new life, he far outweighs it. God's glory is greater than the combination of all joys and all pleasures in earth and in heaven. Whom have I on earth but you? And there's none I desire in heaven beside you, says the psalmist. All earthly pleasures are but like a little flame on a candle wick. But the glory of God is as a thousand suns. And even that is a number of suns that is, is too small to rightly contrast the glory of God with all other delights and all other pleasures. His glory is so great that it's the chief purpose of heaven. Revelation 21, verse 23, tells us this very thing. It says, The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. In other words, the glory of heaven is the glory of God. And it far outweighs the most glorious things that our earthly minds can comprehend. Heaven would therefore be a dark place without God shining in it, without God being present in it. And this is why Jesus prays to the Father for us in John 17, verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, those saints in the land, those excellent ones, and whom is all my delight, that they may be with me where I am, in my presence. Why? To see my glory that you have given to me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you hear what Jesus wants for his saints? For the ones in whom is all his delight that they themselves would taste of the greatest delight of being in his presence, of seeing his glory. He's praying for his people for the highest possible joy that there is. Because he knows that the glory of the triune God is the most filling and satisfying thing to behold. And he prays we would experience it in his presence. It is God's glory which makes heaven full of righteousness and empty of sin. All sin and suffering and sadness and temptation and the curse and and all such things are incompatible with the glory of God. 
And so many fail to understand this about heaven. For when you ask people, what is it about heaven that they look forward to? They, they imagine one where they just get to live forever and get to continue in their, their lusts and in their pleasures, a heaven where their sin continues on, and they just get in an eternity to enjoy whatever they want to enjoy. And our love for sin, it's just going to prevent these clear apprehensions of the glories and of the joys of heaven. Because heaven would be a, a place of sorrow if even one sin, if even one idol was found in it. Revelation 22 verse 3 says, no longer will there be anything accursed. It's unfit for the glories of heaven. It's unfit for being in my presence. So Jesus, he despises sin, and especially as he tasted the sorrow that sin brings, and thus he anticipated being in the place where sin cannot exist, in the presence of God's glory. He would be no more with the perverse and crooked generation. He longed for the place where there would be no more idolatry, but only pure worship and praise and glory to the God to whom it is due. Revelation 22 verse 3 continues. It says, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. He longed for the place where idolatry would be no more, and worship would be the, the full theme of heaven. Isaiah 2.18, the idols shall utterly pass away. No more. There's no trace of idolatry in heaven. Heaven would be a, a sad place. A sad place if one idol made it through. Like Rachel hiding the idol on the donkey as her and Jacob and Leah and the rest go back to the land. Or like Achan, when he hid his idols under his tent after they defeated Jericho. Not one idol is welcome in the kingdom of heaven. Just as much as not one idol of Achan's was welcomed into the promised land. You see, God must be the cause of highest joy. And the joy of heaven, it must be God. Because if it was anything higher, if it was anything greater, then God would not be God. Because how could there possibly be something better than God? And if there was something better than God, then that itself would be God. Therefore, it's, it's God's nature to be the greatest good and therefore the greatest source of joy. He is everything good, and in him there's no darkness, no sin, just pure righteousness and pure glory, and therefore a, a, a true reason of full and perfect joy. And that is what Jesus saw. Jesus must long for God. God must be his treasure, must be his portion, because if he longs for anything else, he would be guilty of idolatry. Do you see? God is... His one desire, and he desires nothing else. He's his greatest desire. And so even in the greatest agonies of the cross, the heart of Jesus was fully in tune with pure worship toward this God of glory so that he desired nothing more. God was indeed faithful. He indeed took Jesus to be with himself. Both body and soul ascended to the right hand of God, and there the man of sorrows became the man of full and perfect joy. It would be there that Jesus would experience the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. He was not disappointed when he entered into heaven. And neither will he be disappointed throughout all eternity. And so for the remainder of our time, I want to ask you this question and ask it to your own heart. Ask it before God. Let the, the, the judge of the secrets of the hearts of men sit with you in your heart and expose it. Because 
if knowing God and being in His presence was enough for Christ, will it be enough for you? If knowing God is not enough for you, that you want something more, God is not enough. And I tell you, it's because you want something more than God, and that is called an idol. And your idol is only going to disappoint you. It's only going to greatly multiply your sorrows. So may God reveal today as to, to what you might be cherishing more than Him. As to what joys are competing with His joys. What are you looking for in this world that you ought to be looking for in God? The greatest problem with Christians today is that they think too little of these joys set before them. Heaven is barely contemplated and earth becomes, becomes the primary focus. So have you ever heard the term that this man is, is so heavenly minded that he's of no earthly good? Some of you maybe have heard that. Yeah? All right. Because they say that how can you be of any good in this world if your heart is in heaven? How can you be of any good if your affections are not for this world? How could you be kind and gracious and loving and doing great things in this world if you're just so focused on heaven? But nothing can be more false than that statement. That statement ultimately is just, it's an excuse for idolatry. It's an excuse for earthly mindedness. We say, oh, we need our phones, we need our social media, we need our money, we need these great possessions and college degrees, and if we don't get these things, we're empty. That's not true. If we don't get these things, we're not effective in this world, and that's not true. We think that we need things that God never tells us that we need. And so the exact opposite of that statement is true. And the gospel is proof of that, that there's no greater good then the work of salvation at the cross, and I tell you that that was accomplished not because Jesus was earthly minded, but because his mind and his heart and his affections were set in heaven. They were set in his Father's presence. That's how salvation came about. It wasn't because Jesus was earthly minded. He was so heavenly minded that he was of the greatest earthly good, and he brought sinners into a full and perfect salvation. And there's ideas that are growing in American Christianity that it's our job to be so focused on this world that we change and we fix it. And this has caused so many to lose their focus on what truly matters and what we should truly be looking forward to as citizens of a better country. And so I'm confident to say this, that you are of no earthly good without being heavenly minded. You can never be too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. And when you read church history, all the people that changed this world for the sake of Christ, it's not because they went out to change the world, it's because they delighted in what God was going to bring them into in heaven. They focused on greater things. And as for this world, it was crucified to them and they to it. Don't set the restoration of America's prosperity before you. Set heaven before you and the joys that are unspeakable and full of glory before you. What no eye has seen nor ear has heard. Set that before you. That's better. That's greater. I know this comes in the week of the 4th of July. And I, I say this with, with love for you because so many Christians today have failed to crucify even America to themselves. And we're clinging to it and hoping in it and, and casting our, all, all, our, all our weight upon it. And this is all my hope. If, if America collapses, I collapse. That's not the case. 
We have a better country, a greater thing to look forward to. So why are we wasting our hopes on things which will just disappoint? Why do we hope in the prosperity of America? It's nothing more than just a comfortable room on the Titanic. It's going to sink with the rest of the wicked nations. Leave behind these lesser joys. Enter into greater joys by longing for your master. Enter into the joys of your master. Look forward to the things that truly matter and have a a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And nothing can touch that. Those are secure. And as for you who have come in today weary and discouraged, know this, that your cross was not as heavy as his was. But your joys set before you are as heavy as his were. Do you get that distinction? He had a heavier cross and great joys. You have a much lighter cross and the same joys. His resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God secures the same joys for you and makes this entire psalm applicable to you and I. All you have to do as a Christian is to look upon Jesus and see all that God has done for us in him and through him and say, yes, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Do you get that? What God is going to do for you is so pleasing and so wonderful because he did it first for Christ. How can we despair when we know the outcome of our faith is the salvation of our souls? How can Christians despair when they look to Jesus? Why are you anxious about your body when you know that it will be resurrected like his was? And why are you worried about this earth when you will leave it as he did? And why are you worried about what you own and what you possess if God is your portion? Why do you worry about what is set before you as terrifying as it might be when God's word has plainly told us that it's these joys that are set before us? Stop wasting your hope on lesser things that multiply your sorrow. and Enter into the highest joy there is by gazing upon Christ, beholding Him day after day, week after week, year after year, until those joys become an eternal reality. And in His presence, you live on forever, knowing and enjoying Him. Enter into those highest joys, and then you will run and not grow weary. Then you will smile even if your cross is heavy. Then you will resist sin to the point of shedding your blood because there's a greater pleasure than whatever temptation is offering me in this present moment. I'm looking forward to it. I'm longing after it. What was sufficient for Jesus will be sufficient for you regardless of what burden you carry today. Look upon what he looked at. Run after what he ran after. Long after what he longed after. Delight in what he delighted in. Look forward to what he looked forward to. Enter into his joys, which are ours in him and through him. And lastly, I'm sure there are some here who have not even tasted of this salvation You're an unbeliever. You're following after some false god. And I tell you this, that you are outside the walls of joy. And outside the walls of joy is uh, these deep waters that have an infinite abyss. And those idols that you cling to just sink you down into that water. 
deeper and deeper and deeper, adding sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow, keeping you from enjoying a salvation that is freely offered to you. Because I tell you that there is a gate into the city of joy. And Jesus is that gate. And you enter by him. And you cannot take these household gods with you. You cannot come to Jesus clinging to your idols. For Jesus says to you, here you have no need of those. For I will be your God. Leave those behind. Leave those behind, for they'll just multiply your sorrows. And sorrows are not fitting for my Father's kingdom. For my Father dwells in his kingdom. And those who enter it enjoy him and experience a fullness of joy. Enter into my kingdom by faith and experience multiplied joys. So sinners, why do you tarry? Why do you cling to things that will just disappoint? Their outcome is not the salvation of your soul. It's just unending sorrow, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a reality, and by clinging to those idols, you'll be sunk into it forever, and you'll never surface. And you'll never have the opportunity to enter into this salvation that Christ has brought about for sinners such as you and I. Why do you refuse Jesus and continue to drown in unending sorrows? Leave what you worship behind today. Lest those gates shut and you're just left there to sink and sink and sink. Leave what you worship behind today and come to Jesus. Believe in what He has done on the cross and enter into God's presence with whom there is a fullness of joy forevermore. Let us bow our hearts before this God. O Lord, whom have I in heaven beside you? There's nothing greater in heaven than that you dwell there, than that your glory shines there. That the greatest glories of this world, the sun and the moon, they have no need there. God, I pray that each person here today, that you would examine their hearts. That as we take communion together next week, that not a single person would come to it still clinging to their idols and saying, I need these, I need these, I need these. God, show them something better in Christ that they might just let go of this world and, and cling to something greater. Don't let anybody here, Lord, who has clung to an idol just be comfortable. Multiply their sorrows, Lord, that they might look for something better, that they might enter into your joy, that they might receive your salvation, your life, Your righteousness. Lord, reveal sin in every heart here so that we may turn from it and look upon something far better and enter into something that is unspeakable and full of glory. Please, Lord, don't let these words return void. Don't let another idol grip the hearts of these people as they leave church here today and just go off into their routines. Grip them. Grip their hearts, God. And if it takes 
your hand, bringing them into the depths of sorrow so that they might taste the joys of your salvation. Let it be. Just don't let anybody here, Lord, walk away thinking they're secure when all along they don't know you, they don't care about you, and they just want their idols. Turn every heart toward you, Lord, and let every weary and heavy laden saint who is coming here today find a great joy in what is awaiting them because you are seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. It's in your name I pray these things. Amen.